particularly mainstream everybody. And I think the star child, the DNA, the evidence of that is so overwhelming and so convincing that once that breach in the dam occurs, I think that there will be then a, a, an ever escalating torrent so that things like Sitchin, like hominoids, like, uh, you know, all of alternative knowledge suddenly has a lot more respect overnight. But something has to, to cause that breach in the dam. And personally, I, and it isn't just because of me, if it was somebody else doing it, I think I could look at, at it and say, that's the area that we have the best chance of, of staking out our territory and making it stick. Super. Skype line's open, by the way, and that's George 97313. Jonathan in Decatur, Georgia, east of the Rockies, you're on with Lloyd Pye. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hey, George Lloyd. Uh, I'm a great admirer of your work, Lloyd. Uh, I spent a couple hours on your side a few years back. It was very impressive. Um, a fourth kind movie, though. Uh, I don't know. That movie scared the hell out of me. <laughs> It, it implied that these uh, beings are evil, and I personally don't buy that. But, uh, you know, I hope somebody like Bob Bigelow, who you know, was instrumental in getting Coast off the ground, I hope somebody like him, uh, you know, shows some interest in your work. Uh, I think it's very credible. And uh, my question is, have you seen these skulls down in a museum in Peru that are like five times the size of a normal human skull, and they look like, I don't know, to me, they look like normal human skulls, but there's two of them. I've seen a picture of this guy gave me a book some years ago. They're like five times the size. I was wondering if you were aware of these particular skulls and what you have to say about them. Well, that that's somewhat of an exaggeration. They're not really five times, but uh, they are what we were talking about earlier, the coneheads. They're just called that um, collectively. But um, those, yes, I, I'm very aware of them. Um, I, I, as I said earlier, I think they have as good a chance as the star child of proving out to be not entirely human. Well, you know, we uh, we will get answers sooner than later. I hope, Lloyd. Don't you think? I think I think so. Now, with with where we are, anyway. Now, I don't know what's going on with any of the coneheads down there. I mean, for all I know, somebody is is actually working on. Um, some of them, but I, if they are, I don't know. You know, I don't know about it at this point. But I do know what we're doing with the Star Child, and I do know how uh, how enormous the first round of testing was in terms of its result, and how equally enormous the subsequent ones are going to be, such that. Eventually, the day is going to come. I mean, when we get the 454 money, George, I mean, this, the, the money to do the testing with the 454 technology such that he can recover the whole entire genome of the star child. I mean, the whole entire genome in about, he says, six weeks, two months at the outside. I mean, can you imagine? You have the whole thing, three billion plus base pairs, and you're beginning, you, you at that point begin to try to uh, establish what the percentage different is, difference is from the human genome or the chimp genome or the Neanderthal genome, and, and you'll find out. And I have to tell you that from the, from the first very initial, but looking at the percentages, it could well be. I mean, it, I've said all along, I, it, it has to be out in the range of chimps and gorillas because physiologically, the star child is so different in the skull. Yes. And, if, and if all of those physiological changes have to be engineered by genes, the, the genes of the star child have to be dramatically different. So I've been saying for a long time, well, they have to be out in the range of, of chimps or gorillas. The geneticist feels, based on the early percentages, it'll, it'll be substantially more than that, uh, which would be... I mean, my, my concern has been that, well, if we found out that the star child was only like 1% difference. Now, all humans, we're all like 99.99% the same. We're very much alike. We're, we're not far from clones. But, but so that's, and chimps that's are right. like, we're 97 percent the same in our in our genome as chimps and 95 percent the same as gorillas so i was worried like okay if you get the star child's like around one percent different 
does that make it alien? Will that be accepted as alien? That would be a hard struggle to, you know, even though it is, even though all humans are 99.99 and you've got, you know, 99, where's the missing 99? But, but, you know, if if that 1% is unfounded on any other place on this planet, then it might be considered alien. Well, but that's the whole point. There was a lot of it, a lot of it that wasn't found. I mean, relatively speaking. So you're moving it out maybe past chimps and gorillas and well past, which would be, there would be just no argument. It would be the equivalent of, you know, the the mainstream critics and skeptics uh, in the end are going to be faced with a mountain of evidence the size of the Great Pyramid. I mean, have you ever stood at the base of the Great Pyramid and looked up? It looks like it's so straight it's almost going to fall on you, right? I mean, it's just it, it's overwhelming. That's what we need to do and what we hope we're going to be able to do and anticipate that we'll be able to do in terms of the evidence. I'm getting emails now from people who are finding out about this, and they're saying, oh, man, these guys are going to smoke you. They, they'll never, they won't accept it. They can't accept it. It'll change everything. Well, uh, if it was anything but DNA, yeah, all they'd have to do is say, you know, you're wrong. You made a mistake. You, you just don't know what you're talking about. You're not an expert. We're experts. You have to listen to us, and nobody has to listen to you. But with DNA, because it's so precise, because it's repeatable, we really have the edge here now. We really have science on our side, and I think we can win. I think we can win, not just win, but win big with this. It's now really not a question of if we can do this as it was for 11 years. It's really, George, I promise, it's down to just when and how are we going to get it done. That's basically it. And you're getting close. Fresno, California. Robert, you're on with Lloyd Pye on Coast to Coast. Hi, Robert. Hi, I'm on a cell phone, so hopefully uh, I don't lose my connection here. Okay. Um, listening to your, your recent comments, another question came to mind. Um, you know, Well, it's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to be skeptical in anything, but you know, a lot of topics that you have on your show, the mainstream science, they don't they don't support it or don't even want to look at it. And I don't understand why. You know, if it doesn't exist, why would they why don't they have an open mind if they're scientists? Shouldn't they have an open mind and, and be willing to look at this stuff and either prove it or disprove it? Well, you know, that's that's the the image that they project. It's what their publicists put out there. But the fact of the matter is across the board Science has very, <clears throat> excuse me, very narrow windows that they can explore outside what is accepted. They are perfectly willing to take an inch step forward so that everybody kind of goes together and there's not a problem. But when someone comes up and says, okay, I'm going to ask you to take a giant step forward and everything that you think you know and everything that you've written and everything that you believe is going to have to change, and, and but you're just going to have to suck it up and move on and, and adjust to it. Nobody wants to do that, and that's really what they face with certain issues that they're confronted with, uh, things like aliens, UFOs, hominoids, things that are going to rock their world and, and in a way that they'll never get over in their lifetimes. The younger ones that are going to come up behind them, not a problem, because they're going to grow up with that reality, and it it won't be difficult. But for the ones who are alive when the big change happens, it is traumatizing, and it it just wrecks wrecks their lives and their careers. So they don't want it to happen, and they work hard to avoid it. Absolutely. Next up, we go to Greg, Olympia, Washington. It's your turn, Greg. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I will, I hope I'm not going to backstory this thing, so I hope you know what I'm talking about. All do, you right. know anything, do you know anything about uh, Oliver the Chimpanzee? He's, well, in, he's in the same boat as your skull. No, not really. Actually, when Oliver was first moved to San Antonio, this was about probably 10 years ago, and I don't even know if Oliver's still alive, frankly. But oh, he's old. He's if, very, very if, old. if he's still alive. Okay, well, but at the time when he had first moved to San Antonio and they were trying... Now, for those who don't know, Oliver the Chimp is a chimpanzee that habitually walks upright, and his owners when he was young, treated him very much like a human, taught him how to drink beer, taught him how to smoke cigars, you know, as part of a, as part of a show because he, he walked upright. Uh, 
He's 52, uh, by the way, as a, as a chimp. He's 52 years old. 50, wow, that is really – but he's been 